Inga, Judith, Nay, Sally, Zara. Thank you, John. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to this panel, New Connections for Language and Technology. But first of all, on behalf of the panel, I want to pay our respect to the Ngunnawal and Ngandri people of the Canberra region on whose lands, traditional lands, we're holding this meeting. So here we have a panel of the bright young future thinkers. And because they're future thinkers, they'd already pre-planned what they wanted in terms of how the panel would go. So they've rebelled against the structure that was given to them. And instead, they want to have approximately five minutes each for their own presentations. Then they want to have around about 20 minutes panel discussion between the panel members. But they're really open to the idea of audience tuning in, and then the last second just could be audience question and answer. So if you're burning to say something when they're having the panel discussion, just put your hand up and I'll keep note. All right, so, um, yeah, so this panel is New Connections for Language and Technology, and we've got Judith Bishop up first. So Dr. Judith Bishop managed the linguistic teams at Appen for 17 years. Between 2012 and 2016, Judith led the linguistic data annotation strategy for Appen on the IAPA Babel program. Babel developed ASR and keyword search models for 26 typologically distinct languages, many of them low resource or new to language technology. So come on up. Thanks, Judith. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? I'm not sure whether that's good. Um, thanks so much, Ina. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that my presentation was uh, prepared on unceded Wurundjeri or wrong country and the most thanks to this class present and emerging. So linguistic diversity in AI, I'm going to start with linguistic diversity and come to the provocation uh, at the end. So my executive summary in the title is that every type of linguistic diversity needs to be modelled by AI to avoid some of the identity-related harms that we have seen uh, and heard about in so many of the presentations uh, today. And it was lovely to hear again um, from Jessica, you know, another, another instance of um, the way identity is important uh, in technology. Unfortunately, most of, uh, most of the types of, of linguistic diversity that you can see in the spectrum here, ranging from individual language through ethnolect, sociolect, regilect, register, vernacular, demographic variations associated with age, sexual orientations and genders, down to idiolect and also, um, thank you Jessica, but physiological abilities. Uh, most of these are not well captured, not well uh, processed by commercial AI models. And by commercial AI models, I mean both natural language processing and computer version models, such as again, uh, you saw in, in Jessica's presentation. Um, just, um, what I want to say is that what, what I mean by identity-related harms are the types of suppression and exclusion that lead of linguistic identities that lead to emotional harm. So what is the problem? Um, essentially, and we've, we've heard it again in, in other presentations as well, is that uh, things that are not present, variation that is not present in the training data um, is not going to be well processed by AI systems leading to poor performance. So a very canonical case uh, was the early computer vision systems that were trained on predominantly white and male um, faces, unsurprisingly performed very badly on African American women's faces. And in natural language processing, we see the same with automated speech recognition performance. Even as recently as 2020 in the Stanford study, we see that the average word error rate uh, for black or African American language speakers is significantly worse than for white speakers across the whole range of commercial voice assistants. So what are some of the, the drivers of this poor linguistic diversity in most commercial applications? And uh, here is where I, I suppose I get a bit provocative. Um, I want to say that there's two. Um, market size is probably fairly obvious, the size of the language variety population uh, that is going to be using the AI device. But secondly, I think the market power of the population uh, is actually possibly more important than the first. Uh, case in point, UK English, about 60 million speakers, and it's in all the major commercial AI applications. Nigerian English, also about 60 million speakers, and is in, is in none. 
Um, and I don't know how well you can see those, those graphs to the right, but in terms of the typical training data split, uh, we see that there are market-driven factors here too. Older speakers, speakers over, or communicators over 55, tend to be a very small proportion of the training data for AI systems, and the same for rural speakers versus urban speakers. So these are, this is what leads to poorer performance for rural and older speakers. So I believe that there are identity harms from poor linguistic diversity in AI in a range of, of levels. Um, I want to sort of go up to an eagle's eye view, if you like, and say that for each of the human language processes, there is a corresponding AI process. I think this may not be surprising to some of you, but um, thinking you know, I would like to talk quickly. <laughs> um, Starting from language perception has its correlate in automated speech recognition, OCR, and image recognition. Language understanding in human beings corresponds to natural language understanding in, in AI, which is um, extracting meanings and extracting intents from, from what is being said. Uh, at the level of, of reference and, and conceptual processing, so the way that language connects to the real world, to the physical world. In AI, we have what are called knowledge graphs, which connect real world entities and instances to categories and concepts. And these are very well embedded in things like search and recommendation engines that we use every day. Language production, conceptualizing, formulating ideas and, and putting the words together corresponds to natural language generation. And finally, articulation and expression corresponds to speech synthesis, text-to-speech, uh, text generation, which we've heard a lot about lately in the media, uh, large language models, and image generation. So what are some of the harms that arise from lack of data diversity in each of these processes? Well, first up, um, there is this harm of exclusion. If diverse speakers and communicators cannot be well understand or well understood or perceived by an AI system, then they are going to feel excluded from using that system or that tool. And this is referred to as quality of service or allocation of quality of benefit biases. Going down, I really haven't seen much about this level of, of bias, but uh, I can see the potential for exclusion of diverse worldviews, values, and relationships at the knowledge layer if the knowledge graphs do not incorporate these diverse worldviews, values, and relationships. I'm thinking particularly in the indigenous contexts where these are so different. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'll continue to raise. Um, and just um, in terms of language production, going back to what I said about training data inputs, the, the variation uh, AI systems can only produce outputs that reflect the, the training data inputs. So if there isn't sufficient variety in the inputs, they will not be in the outputs. And this leads to some of the things that we have heard talked about in terms of lang diverse language speakers and communicators not seeing themselves reflected in AI technology, especially I think of children. These people will not see themselves reflected in the future also that is being developed with these technologies. Sorry, <laughs> Um, achieving linguistic diversity in AI is going to require a much more balanced view. Um, the commercial view is very powerful, essentially starting where the market is and building in more diversity later if there's a business case. There tends to be a, a, a bias towards engineering first design, which is we have all these amazing technological capabilities, and what can we do with these in a business sense to um, generate revenue? Um, and we've seen some fantastic examples of another view um, in the last couple of days, the community view, which is that we have to design these technologies um, to embrace linguistic and socio-cultural diversity from the get-go. has to be community-led, participatory design, um, talking to the converted, but also just asking the question, instead of you know, what products, in a business sense, um, should we be making, what community needs can be addressed with these technologies? Uh, so why provocation? Well, these commercial pressures are powerful. How do we nonetheless get more linguistic and socio-cultural diversity into AI? Um, I think that I've personally um, found astounding is that linguistic diversity is rarely mentioned in relation to AI bias. There's a lot of, of talk around responsible and inclusive AI, but very few of these actually refer to um, linguistic exclusion. And I actually did a search on linguistic diversity in AI, the exact words, and I had about seven results. Uh, that was my own provocation for writing this, um, this presentation. And I love how the first result is we need to talk about linguistic <laughs> diversity in AI. So as linguists, we do. We do need to talk about it. We need to promote the need for it. And Inga is waving me down. <laughs> and we have, also have to use AI ourselves um, and in order to understand from the inside how it works. So 
Uh, Nay and Sally are going to talk about how it can support linguistic research, and Zara is going to talk about how it can support practical applications. Thank you. Sorry. She's too full of energy there. So next up we have Zara Maxwell-Smith, who's an Indonesian teacher and research student here at the ANU. Her work seeks computational insights into language teaching, pushing technology to work with challenging data. Thanks, Zara. So my original title uh, sort of implies this one-way street where technology works for language teachers, but this sort of brings to mind, my little swap is not going to work for me, um, uh, the disability jungle that Pete Worthy's talk talked about yesterday and also I think Jess has noticed this, this area. So instead my focus is on what working with teachers and other disciplines actually does for technology development. So as we integrate more of our lives as well as our language research, research with technologies, I see the critical and questioning use of those technologies or natural language processing, NLP, as a central issue. And my experience has been that this issue is better illuminated by transdisciplinary work, and I think I'm building on what Judith has talked about here, in which expertise, passion, and an understanding of real use cases in a given field drive and inform how technology is developed and used. So lights in the dark are elusive and can lead you astray like a minion or a swamp light, but time spent with others sitting in a transdisciplinary space illuminates at least the immediate uh, surrounds and values a range of perspectives. So it mitigates bias and it grows the sort of diversity that Judith has mentioned. It helps to promote balance among the sectors because as we've heard, market forces can and have created much of the technology that's available to us. So working in a deeply transdisciplinary space myself, bridging applied and computational linguistics, language acquisition research and Indonesian language teaching, my learning curve has been steep developing basic programming skills and specialised corpus cleaning methods using a scoping study to help uncover uh, NLP trends and working with colleagues to train and compare language models. My endeavour to look at real teaching and address professional questions such as what materials have usage-based evidence behind the vocabulary selection or how should I represent and position myself in, uh, in relation to diagnostic variants of a given uh, language led me to interactive classroom data, textbook analysis, and thanks to COVID, online lessons on YouTube. So with these professional questions to drive my research questions, concern about bias and unmonitored multiplication of bias in uh, the data sets uh, and the models that we use has been front of mind. So along the way, I've contributed to NLP for under-resourced languages and NLP for multi lingual data. So while transdisciplinary work tends to lay bare many assumptions and problems in the disciplines it involves, when this transdisciplinary work comes into interactions with NLP, and that's one of the disciplines that is involved, um, there's motivation for work outside market forces. It promotes diversity and representative, uh, representation of language which normally tends to be neglected by the development of technology. So a general interest in NLP would probably lead one to choose the green options where there is money, data that doesn't need to be transcribed or at least that stays in one language. But with a specific use case driven interest, research is likely to confront these blue options. Some of which are obvious, but I know from my scoping review that I'm pretty unusual in working with spoken language and interactive and complex code switching data. So why would I do these sorts of things? And this is, I think, where the transdisciplinary element really comes in, is that, that when you're an applied linguist, you know that Indonesian changes so dramatically from a formal written uh, version to a spoken language. You know that artificially constructed data with minimal or simple code switching behaviours does not match what students will encounter. So when you know and value what teachers do, you want to take steps, and you want to take steps to understand how we as teachers use the messy Indonesian superglossia, you, you're willing to wade into the mud. So it's these professional questions, uh, personal connections with language, community, expertise, lived expertise we heard yesterday, are things that, sorry, things to play by itself, um, things that help us to wade into the mud and wrestle with technology. It also illuminates risks of bias, 
In particular, it has to be. Remember, Gimana is a short term for market mana, and Gimana is used for informal situation. Gimana kabar mo how are you? So, sorry. As we've heard from Judith, and I think this came through a little bit in one of um, Nick's questions yesterday, what you do with training data, what you feed to a machine to learn from, is what it learns, right? So how you transcribe something like this really matters to how the machine will start to work with future data, but also what kind of biases you're introducing and what understanding you're teaching to a machine. So I think when you've got a lot of um, interest and expertise, then you make a decision that's based on a research question. You tend to be quite upfront about that when you publish and you're honest about it, right? Because you really care that the model that you use, that the future use of that technology actually has the intended outcome for the people that you're planning for it to work with. So for me, you can see how it, how it was. It's a fairly simple um, transcription with um, a focus for me on vocabulary input, but other people might do something quite different. Sorry, <laughs> it's not on a timer. Um, so, I suppose my main point was just to say that often this sort of data gets put into the noise category or treated as an outlier and then gets neglected and I think you heard the same message there from Judith. My, I wanted to finish on a grateful acknowledgement that it's public funding like CODLS had that supports transdisciplinary spaces, that it allows this sort of less glamorous work to take place in a variety of sectors and that it uh, allows it to be published in open access venues. In my project, I'm very grateful that my teachers from YouTube have agreed to make their data available as open data. So I want to echo some of what I've heard throughout the three days actually, but a sort of call to arms to seek out transdisciplinary connections, especially with those in education, that's my little push, um, so that diverse work in NLP is known and useful to others and that, so that many eyes can watch for the sort of bias that we all worry about. And I'll stop there because I think I'm tying a bit with May. Um, working on speech data is a sensitive and low resource setting. Thanks. Yeah, so we welcome um, May San, who many of us know, who's come back to us from Stanford, where he's doing a PhD and his research, his research there is examining how modern speech and language technologies can be adapted for typically underserved languages and user populations, with a particular focus on supporting data management workflows for language documentation and revitalization. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ian. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, uh, for coming out to this event. Um, and I'd just like to echo this sort of um, experience of transdisciplinary-ness at CODL because um, I sort of started as an RA for Jane in CODL before I started my PhD and that's, you know, that transdisciplinary-ness has been, you know, I've been able to carry it on and it's only because of that support and connections that I had made through CODL that this research could have been done. Um, so let me get started on what I've been doing recently. Um, so, you know, we've heard from uh, Dan and Vanya today and, and many of us know from first-hand experience, recording audio is much easier than transcribing. Um, and so you end up with this sort of transcription bottleneck and so on. Um, and one, one sort of problematic thing that comes up with that is that untranscribed audio is hard to search and repeat. And so we've heard from Wolfgang about, you know, corpus search things are mainly text-based. Um, and so this has been the space I've been interested in lately of how can we work with untranscribed audio and make it easier to sort of search and retrieve for things you want to, uh, you want to get at. Um, and, the, and the question I've been sort of asking is, can we get the machines to do some of the heavy lifting? And, you know, the answer is sometimes. Um, and like sort of Pete Worthy said, there's no silver bullet uh, for so just untranscribed audio, you know, this is how you do it or something like that. So uh, one of the things I want to find out through this research is sort of like, when, when is X or Y technology useful? What sort of performance can we expect in X and Y conditions? Uh, and like to sort of, you know, give you the news on some of that. Um, uh, so the, the first case scenario I've been examining is this um, sort of use case where you have mixed language recordings. Um, and this uh, project really came out of like, you know, thanks to CODL because um, uh, Jane asked me to sort of sit in on some of the scholar, summer scholars from last year, Alison Mount, Ruben Thompson, and Michael Higgins. Uh, and, I, you know, and, and it was sort of a, a project they were doing with the Murugai Elder 
uh, Roy Walker Jr. and I was just sort of uh, looking to advise wherever I can. And you know, it, it was them, it was me sort of absorbing on what the goals of that project was, was, you know, uh, came up with, you know, ways to sort of maybe try and improve things uh, to speed things up because they have to process about 130 hours of uh, untranscribed audio. Um, but one of the characteristics about this audio is that it's sort of there's mixed language recordings where there's a mix between English and Muruwari, where there's the, the English is being used as a meta language to describe the Muruwari, which you might find in many field recordings. Um, can we play the audio? to automatically transcribe the English. And that immediately gave you a reference of where various things were being talked about in English and you could sort of, you know, uh, approximate a, as a sort of index where various Muruwari words might be happening. And so that sort of uh, sped up the transcription process a little bit by 20%. And, and I'll come back to this specific uh, number later. Um, and the second sort of project that I want to talk about is um, what happens when you only have monolingual recordings and you can't sort of do this uh, workflow? And so uh, one of the things that I tried was this idea of spoken term detection. Uh, so this is basically voice search. You, you just take a template, a WAV file, and you try and match it in various parts of the corpus and sort of rank how likely you know, this utterance has that keyword and so on. Um, and again, I was interested in you know, what are the, the failure modes and so on. And what sort of performance can we expect? Because one of the things we know from spoken term detection work is just that, you know, if you're matching this, the same speaker in the same sort of set of recordings around the same sort of field site and so on, where the environments match, then you can do great. But as you change your different speaker or speaker uh, or recordings that are archival or different noise properties, then you're going to start to get really bad performance. And so one of the things I wanted to evaluate was sort of systematically find out what sort of retrieval performance you can expect in these different situations. Um, and again, I was only able to do this because of the help of Codal and the network that I could draw on. Uh, and you know, um, you can tell from these languages who was involved in this. So thanks to Jane Simpson, Sam Disbray, uh, Mitch Brown, David Nash, uh, Stephen Bird, Mitch Turpin, Sasha Wilmoth, John Mansfield, uh, and you know, the people who work on these languages who were able to provide me with sort of specific data to be able to test out uh, these performance characteristics. Uh, and we can see uh, sort of, you know, uh, the performance go up from as good as 85% to as low as 40% sometimes. So here, here's the sort of, you know, managing expectations where, you know, if you have lots of hours of audio and uh, you want to do a certain type of search, you might be looking at about 40%, which, you know, depending on whether you want uh, to, uh, deal with that level of performance over scrolling through, you know, uh, tens of hours in real time or something like that. So this is the sort of performance that we can expect here. Uh, and let me just say, the, what I want to end on is that, um, you know, in, in future I hope more and more that we are able to draw on these ways of using machines to assist with annotation in particular sort of search and retrieval context as well. And, and finally, you know, uh, I, I mentioned the 20% that I'll come back to. Uh, I, I want to sort of you know, temper ex expectations because AI has so much hype around it that you know, the kind of assistance that, you know, um, you know, that we could draw on is this sort of cruise control or something like you know, that takes a little bit of the cognitive load out of the hardship of transcription and so on. But it's not teleportation. It won't get you there instantly. Thank you. Clearly the format's not working the five minutes, <laughs> but we'll keep going because we had a long time. So thanks, May. And next up we have Saliha Muradolu, who is here 
at ANU, working between computer science and linguistics. She's a fourth year PhD student. Her background is actually in physics, but she works on computational morphology. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you. Um, there, there, there. Oh. Ironic that we're here to represent tech and struggles working through this. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm here to talk to you a bit about morphology, which we've talked a lot about different kinds of texts in different spaces, but your morphology now is a representative. So um, working on the next level up um, after you've transcribed and you do have some text. Um, so I actually wanted to start with the big thing when I got asked to be on this panel was what I what I interpreted to mean what's the future um, intersecting between technology and language. Um, and I think one of the big things that I see for the future, maybe not immediate future, but future future, um, in, um, would be something like um, a bit more of a feedback from computer science. Um, and being cautious about that. So I don't want to come here and tell you that the computers are doing everything amazing, but I'm suggesting that we use them as supplementary means of investigation into some of these systems. So I want to give a mini example of some of the current work that I'm working on um, with Mans Halden from the University of Colorado. Um, so I'm looking at modeling morphology um, and this is one particular task within morphology, so we're looking at inflection. So we might actually train um, neural network models um, in the first half, so you would actually give it a lemma, as the, as the example shows, run um, with the more and tactics um, of the, the past, and then we wanted to produce brand. So we trained it on a whole set of those, and then we test whether it's actually learned something like the morphological paradigm. Um, so why neural networks? Um, the whole idea for this is because basically I was mainly resistance to this because finite state technology exists, but um, you can't deny the sort of incredible power it has in terms of generalizations, the fact that they're fast, and easy to train. Um, but the one caveat, of course, is that you always get told you need more data um, to train these. Uh, so another string to motivate why neural networks is in the shared task of SIGMORPHON, which is a specific task that looks at the morphological inflection. Um, basically, the top performing, performing models for the last six years have been um, neural based. So uh, the whole list of literature in that. Um, and basically the data for this kind of work actually comes from the Unimorph project, um, which actually some of you guys have contributed to. Um, so the idea there is to have some kind of standardized way to kind of tag for more syntactic um, features so we can actually train these models across languages as well. So um, one of my, sorry, my project that I'm actually focusing on at the moment is based on active learning. So the idea there is that we're actually prompting our models to tell us what kind of data they actually need. Um, and you might imagine why. So in the low resource setting, this is actually um, very powerful. So the analogy I would just do itself, um, the analogy here is that you have a finite set of wall, and if you wanted to actually represent impressionism, you might think it's sensible to prioritize Monet and various works that are seminal and informative. Um, so, just uh, a quick look at our results. Um, so we had uh, basically two um, studies, two sampling methods um, that basically correlate to an oracle. So it might be someone like a linguist or a language speaker that can tell you whether the inflection was correct or incorrect. Um, so the tick is when they get correct and the incorrect, um, the X. I should note, um, along the x-axis we've got the resampling types and along the y um, we have a change in accuracy. So from the first iteration to the second, whether the accuracy of the models actually increased. Um, so unsurprisingly, you would see that um, when we resample based on when the model gets it wrong, um, you actually see the most improvement. Uh, I think that makes sense for most of us. Um, perhaps interestingly, um, so if we actually sample based and use the sort of model generated um, log likelihoods or confidence levels, we can see that kind of parallels um, with the correct incorrect. So if you look at the low confidence forms, um, we can see that um, basically it's kind of like getting, uh, giving, selecting the incorrect forms again. Um, and then the 
and we'll, we'll blame these super confidence, but we see that it's actually not doing that great. And in some cases, it actually makes them all the worst. So, um, and we do this across 30 different languages. So the one thing I want to say is we've heard a lot about corpus building, but there is kind of, there might, this is, uh, there is sometimes, um, the needs of like building these kinds of models aren't necessarily the same as the corpus built by linguists. So um, we want to be able to involve um, the models and interrogate them. So I think, again, one of the things I see for the future is a more integrated flow. So it's not necessarily at the end stop once you've collected all the data that you then give it to someone or work on language tech yourself, um, but that it's an integrated process. I think it's not going to come out here. So, so thank you. Uh, so now we've got about half an hour left. We'll go first into the format where the panel has their own little internal conversation. Feel free to join if, in if you want to be asking any questions, otherwise we'll move on in about um, sort of 15 minutes to general audience questions. But I'll, I'll do the kind of Dorothy Dixon to get it going. So you all kind of signaled future directions, which is the task at hand. But as CODA comes to an end, your connection with people here and the kind of future thinking for your own work, what kind of um, future environment would help to progress some of this work? Maybe Judith, would you like to start? Thanks, Sina. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, I would love to see more of, more of this type of work. I would love to see more linguists and computer scientists and natural language engineers working closely together. Now, how that happens, that has to be you know, something that's fostered by institutions. Um, but I, I think it's really essential for us to come closer together and understand each other, um, because of, otherwise this sort of work, which I do see as the future, just you know, can't, it's too hard for it to happen. Uh, the, the gap between the disciplines is, is, quite, is quite far, I think, still. Um, so, yeah, maybe we can talk more about that later, about how these Nayan uh, sorry, uh, Sally and Zara have actually made that, um, made that leap. <laughs> um, I suppose for me, I, the future going forward, it's not necessarily what I think will, uh, will happen, but I think it's important um, to sort of say this and hope that it does happen is that for people who haven't involved themselves in any kind of NLP work, um, but who are linguists voices and who are creating great things, it's really important that you reach out because if you don't start uh, incorporating the NLP, the kind of common options that I see start to happen is that you get speakers or signers um, who are themselves seeking those tools, those technologies, and that they can be quite ill fitting them and it, it can create language change. I mean, you guys know this in communities where you know everything's available in English and so there's not much happening um, for people's local languages, or alternatively, you get a kind of market-driven or pure, purely comp sci, computer science kind of um, people coming in who may have the best of intentions but um, don't necessarily understand the variety of perspectives that can be involved in what are really often very like, wicked kind of problems um, in education, in health, um, in a lot of fields. So I think if you if you want more tech or if you don't want bad tech. <laughs> Even if you don't really want more tech, but if you don't want bad tech, you kind of have to jump in a little bit and be in there because if you're not, then the training data that's being created, if you don't put your training data out there that's high quality, um, then someone else will, or if, if you know, there'll be various ways of getting it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, that's sort of where I'm going with that. Um, thanks, Sarah. Uh, I, I would also sort of like, you know, build on that and echo that sort of connection and sort of conversation starting as well because I think one of the things I, you know, uh, maybe coming to almost like, you know, from a different side there was like for the, uh, the Murawari project, for example, uh, all of the things we used were like off-the-shelf components uh, that was sort of just had to be put together in a, in a fairly creative way, but, you know, I, I guess that's how I contributed my background, but I think it was sort of like saying just getting that conversation going you know, God means like, wait a minute, like, if I take this thing and this thing and this thing, we could sort of, you know, duct tape together a pipeline that sort of like works well enough for the project's purposes. And I think that's sort of like so important because in, in a way it's hard to 
Yeah, and, and it's going the other way as well. It's hard, uh, sort of, like, what you, like, what's like, unknown, unknown sort of thing where you don't know what you don't know, right? So then, you know, if it doesn't occur to you to sort of put those pieces together, uh, then you can just use off-the-shelf technologies in this thing. And I think that's sort of like, having that conversation is so important because then, you know, it, it also opens the technologist to sort of think about, oh, there's this, you know, use case scenario that's so common in sort of, you know, mixed language recordings or something like that, and we could really help in that. And so that's sort of like opening up new tasks because the, you know, the, the AI standard tasks are very sort of like, I mean, it's, it's, it's very homogenous and sort of leaderboard driven, and there's sort of people just competing again for the same tasks over and over again, rather than like coming up with more sort of grounded tasks that are relevant to everyday situations. Ah, doesn't it just? Yeah. Um, uh, I would just add to that that I think it's quite, basically it's human nature to be entrenched in the discipline that you're most comfortable with. And I think what I've learned through bridging the two is to be uncomfortable all the time. And quite frankly, I'm sure you guys have heard me whinge about constantly have to justify my existence, whichever space I'm in. Um, but I think you eventually get comfortable with that. And I think it's not even... I don't know if you guys felt this at all, but even throughout my project, I feel like the degree I was sitting in, like more linguistics or computer science or whatever, has shifted through the project in various times, and I don't think it's necessarily static. Um, and it definitely helps your argument, I think, to try to not necessarily use the same argumentation and expect a different discipline to respect that line of thinking, but to actually see how they do argumentation and adapt it accordingly so you can still get your point across. Um, I found that to be very transformative. I don't know if that was the initial question, but we sort of shifted. That's the beauty of a panel discussion. You're in control. <laughs> so we had talked about opening it up to the audience, and we've got a question from Nick already. So maybe the microphone can come down. Or Nick, you want to use your big uh, Oh, I'll, you need to wait. Um, now you just mentioned about known unknowns, and yesterday Dan and Ben mentioned the fact that the whole transcription bottleneck question wasn't one that had come up within the natural language processing community, and it seems that that sort of thing where, where linguists say, oh yeah, it would be really good to have this sort of thing it is always very useful. And one that I would throw out there uh, as a totally naive question from a technologically incompetent person uh, is the sort of thing that I would love to be able to do, and I'm sure others would, is to be able to interrogate maybe an 80-hour um, archived set of materials in some language of which you know some number of hours, maybe five or eight, have been transcribed and say, oh, can you find the words we don't have yet, uh, at, or the combinations of prefixes and suffixes that we don't have yet wrapped around a verb stem, and so that I can go in and listen to them closely. Because we always have more than we've transcribed, and we're always wrestling with prioritizing and which bits to do, and so that's the sort of thing which would you know, lead us to get quicker to, to some of the discoveries we want to make about a language that you might just say it's ridiculous. But it's, it's the sort of moonshot approach, I think, that's useful to take. That's a fantastic um, question and objective. I, I'm just thinking that I think Nay is closer to having something like that with the spoken term detection. I mean, that's detecting full words. I know it's, it's not necessarily working well yet, but I mean, it's working in that direction, you should also be able to, to search for morphemes, right? Um, so, I mean, I really, I think, just following on from what Nay said, there's so many, um, so many open source um, uh, scripts and, and programs and, and algorithms that I think we really just need to get into the sandpit and see what we can do with them. Um, and see if we can make some of this work. And then not give up because the first time it will flop really badly, but tune and tune again, understand what errors are being made by the system, and then work out you know, what, 
what fine tuning data is needed. Um, again, connecting with um, Sally's active learning idea, try to work out okay, what things is it, is it doing badly, and then feed it more of that. So I, I and you know, I think these these sort of questions are exactly what are needed, Nick, and just we just have to go and play. I'd just like to quickly add, sort of, when you, when you ask that question, Nick, the, maybe, you know, it, it's a similar thing where, like, you know, I hadn't thought of um, the work that's being done in uh, what uh, people are doing this sort of data selection work. Um, but, but now that you've phrased it that way, uh, you know, I could see some of the techniques that are being used in a different field that could be sort of repurposed for that. And, you know, uh, one of the things that people have looked at um, in a, in a recent Google paper, they were, they were, you know, they were sort of addressing this problem of you know, data similarity and data augmentation. So the question was like, you have, you know, um, I, I guess a uh, hundred million hours of YouTube videos, um, and, and so they're going to call that this sort of uh, general pool, and the, and then they're going to have the target pool, uh, which is libre speech, sort of red audio, and, and so you know, the, the, the sort of various prosodic differences and. You know, those are just two separate pools. And the question was, without any transcription or, or, or anything, could you just select the most red speech-like bits of um, YouTube uh, sort of, you know, to, to sort of augment the, the libre speech data, so sort of double the data size for training. Um, and one of the methods that they came up with was sort of this, uh, you know, trying to do uh, modeling without uh, transcription and doing similarity. And, and one of the things that similarity, similarity gives you is also sort of frequency counts, right? You could see this type of sequences is the most frequent, and this type of sequences is the least frequent in the corpus, uh, based only on the sort of audio. So, so it's still not perfect, but you know, you, you might sort of find that uh, when you go and have a closer look at the sort of least frequent sequences, it might be mostly noise, but, but you might also sort of gain insight into sort of the kinds of you know, uh, you know, syllables or sort of phonotactic stuff that are not adequately represented in the corpus yet. And, you know, that might sort of tell you, okay, like for the next field trip, we could focus on these types of sound sequences or something like that. I might just add to that too. I can't see you next, but I am talking to you. <laughs> I suppose um, for me, when I imagine looking through kind of pre-existing archives, with new tools, I suppose there's a part of me that goes, yes, you want to like check the things that we've always looked at in linguistics or that other linguists, maybe not me, have always looked at, but there's also that opportunity, and I think that's kind of where maybe Sally's work comes in a little bit, to ask questions that you maybe haven't really considered before or that might be driven by the speaker community, that something they might want to know that's not traditionally kind of looked at in linguistics, and that you will have new abilities and new um, possibilities open up to you. Um, and then conversely, I think, hopefully it came through in my talk a bit, but also that little bit of a double check as an expert of that language or with knowledge of that community or as a speaker yourself, maybe, um, it's important also to think about what happens when this uh, training data or whatever it is that you're using gets taken up by a machine because everything becomes quite opaque to a human once it's in a... Um, computational format. You can't physiologically check. You can spend your whole life trying to work out a few seconds of transcription from my project, um, looking through the ones and zeros. You know, you can't really check it. So, you need to think carefully about what you know, all of the work you've done over your life, perhaps about, like, for instance, if there's translations in those old archives that you might not be comfortable with, then they will be picked up they will be learned and they will be reproduced potentially in other formats. So it's really important to interrogate the training data that you've used, particularly if it's old. Um, you don't want to have a particular translation of a term come out in through some like you know, text to voice machine in the future, for example, which might use your model. So I suppose there's that kind of unpredictability um, there. And yeah, I think work with some unknown unknowns, but also be aware of the fact that there's some risks involved when you can't check things yourself. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, sure. Um, yeah, I think definitely like now that data-driven AI is a thing, um, and like 
in particular in the linguistic space, if we're not looking at necessarily adapting the sort of technical modeling and architecture of things, the one thing we can sort of control in this pipeline is the data. So I think it makes a lot of sense to look at what our data is saying. And there has been research even in my own work where you can see that what you're not necessarily explicitly saying is still being picked up by the model. So things like syncretism in a morphological paradigm, um, it can predict even though it hasn't seen it before. So um, I think, yeah, it's obviously really hard to say what data is saying, but we can be a little more sensitive to it. We have a question over here, but I think, <laughs> speaking for myself, this is a chance to ask the sort of naive questions that we want to um, ask as well, so don't be afraid. But first we'll go here and then up the back. Um, this might be one of these naive questions. Uh, let's see. And thanks for the very interesting discussion around bias and how to assist users uh, of your technologies with what you're doing. So um, I wanted to dig a little bit more into this because um, what we've heard from Jess Court in her great presentation this morning, um, participatory design is becoming very important in the space whenever we develop to try and learn from users what it is they really need and want. And so often we learn as technologists, right? So we will learn about the use cases and what works and what doesn't work. And um, it seems very unidirectional. And I'm wondering what your ideas are in making that collaboration maybe a bit more equitable. So, because we have the technology knowledge, and we have also the language knowledge, perhaps, and then we learn about the use cases. So the workflow would be, we learn, and we go and create some cool tech, and then we feed that back to a user and ask them, was that what you wanted? And I'm just wondering if, if there might be a way to share more and train people more in making this technology more approachable for them. I love that question, if I can <laughs> respond to that. Um, absolutely, yeah, we don't want to be the, the experts who come in and, and do all the tech work um, and then go out again. We have to be, there has to be a pipeline of diverse talent, doesn't there, going into, going into technology creation. And, um, and that starts with, with things like scholarships, that starts with, you know, really um, thinking about how we can encourage students who might not otherwise think of going into um, natural language processing or computer vision, enc encourage them to do so in whatever way possible because, um, yeah, it, it's not enough for us to be doing, as I say, um, even though I think in that process there is some, you know, there is some good give and take. I mean, I loved Felicity's example of, I mean, um, sort of sharing, sharing understandings, two scientific <coughs> understandings about, you know, the uniqueness of the Gurindji um, geocentric perspective. So there is some um, give and take, but I think we have to start with the, the talent pipeline and work on that. Um, I, I guess like, you know, premature announcement, but I, I think, you know, I, I've gained so much from Codal and sort of what's been passed on to me that I've been sort of trying to wrestle with that question of sort of uh, continuing that. And, and so I've been, after, through the Murray project and uh, beyond, I've been starting to like write uh, an introductory textbook for speech processing that I've been like trialing out with the summer scholars who worked with me. And I'm, my my hope is that that starts like at least like a sort of a first foray into you know being more comfortable with the Python command line and so on, sort of you know uh, getting a sort of you know uh, a technical literacy around you know, the technologies that are being used in, in, a, in a sort of, you know, introductory way, similar to sort of like complementing Elpis, where, you know, Elpis gives you a sort of a, a user-friendly interface so you can get used to the sort of general workflow around uh, transcription and so on. But then, you know, once, once you're sort of comfortable with that and then, um, you know, interested in and are prepared to sort of uh, go one level slightly up uh, and sort of use the you know, the, the models directly, um, you know, there seems, at least, you know, as far as I can tell right now, there's a big gap there because, you know, it's, it's either Elpis 
or <laughs> the error messages that how they or like that even us computer scientists take you know four days to try and work out right so um, and and maybe like you know trying to write the book I, I wish I had <laughs> five years ago um, and so I don't know I think um, ho hopefully you know uh, that's a start but I, but I think you know like um, uh, Judith's sort of suggestions as well I, I think you know um, that there, there needs to be more sort of pathways into the sort of Ensuring that sort of bidirectionality. We do have a question at the back, and then that person's getting the mic up would be super cheeky, and just take the really quick opportunity to say, I think there's someone, um, Catherine, you already know, Ben, you probably already know this, but there's a particular skill set that you need in order to explain how the tool is going to use. If you want, like the exemplar, I would say it's Ben because he just is so patient and takes the time to educate you on a level that works for you. Um, but yeah, I've not been, I mean, I'm a teacher, I've met a lot of teachers, and yeah, shout out to people <laughs> 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 like you. Know, like, um, yeah, so you also a really good student. Thank you so much uh, for all the panelists. As someone who's did the undergraduate in linguistics and then ended up in career technology. I think these discussions about the relationships between language and technology and how they can work closely together are so important, especially with the speed at which AI technologies are developing these days. Um, and, uh, and, and even more generally, I think, between language and technology, but also between anthropologists and technologists and between sociologists, there's an urgent need for like all these disciplines that study people <laughs> and their cultures and their languages. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, I've had long, amazing conversations with Salika and, and Nay in the break, so these are my questions with me directed at, at Judith and Sarah. Um, and I kind of have a suggestion and a question, if, if I can hold the mic a little bit. Um, but I totally agree with this point for more study of uh, and more representation in the, the data sets, both that are used to build and train AI systems, but also in the data sets that we use to evaluate. And, and there's a whole movement around testing for bias using models that is, is, can be done without contributing directly to actual training data sets. And I think there's actually a really sweet spot here, perhaps for more collaborative work in Australia um, on building data sets focused on these kind of regional uh, dialects and sociolects and testing whether these technologies built by global companies work for, for people in these regions. So I think there's opportunities that maybe to collaborate in the sweet spot, maybe, um, as was mentioned, like open data sets uh, that can be valuable for the community and for testing a wide range of technologies. So there may be opportunity there for, for linkage grants or other forms of collaboration, so throwing that out as a suggestion. Um, but the question I had, uh, and I really love your slide with the language analysis and then the knowledge layer and the generation. I think it's often assumed by technologists that analysis and generation are like <laughs> inverses of each other, that, that like one is just the opposite of the other. I think it's a very dangerous assumption. I think it's also often assumed that that knowledge representation layer is uh, culturally independent. And in fact, I think there's often deep cultural biases in that knowledge layer. And we see this, this happen like again and again, I think, and I think it's not discussed enough. Um, and I think, uh, I'll get to the question first. <laughs> We're also building on the great point that was made over here earlier, and I didn't catch the name, about the ways in which we build social identities into the virtual assistants. And by having female assistants, uh, it, it encourages a certain type of social interaction or interactions. And there have been some studies on the amount of verbal abuse and pornographic language that is directed at female assistants, which is really shocking. And there's talk about how assistants maybe could embody more diverse identities. I think we would be really aware of the opportunity for other sorts of abuse there as well. And so as an example, um, there's a need for technologies that understand black American voices more. Um, but I think there's huge risks in actually having an assistant that tries to embody a black American identity 
and have white people telling a black assistant <laughs> to perform commands for them. Um, so the question, I guess, for Zara and Judith is, how can language and, uh, I think specifically can social linguistics and cultural linguistics interact with technology as we need to take more social and cultural factors into account in these generation and knowledge layers, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, so much, so much there in what you said. Um, totally agree to start with with valuation um, and so on. I, I think in my answer, I, I really want to go back to what I was saying before. I think we need um, people trained who, who come to, from and are sensitive to, sensitized to you know, those identity questions personally, because I think it's very hard to, to see the range of, of concerns or responses that there might be uh, from outside. Um, so I, I think that's, that's certainly part of the solution. Is, um, but, uh, but I think another part of the solution is, is also just being aware right, of, of this whole range of you know, what I call identity-related harms, and these are starting to be catalogued, and you know, there's, there's a bit of a typology emerging from so think quality of service um, harm or biases through allocation biases, representational biases where people don't see themselves represented in the AI system. So I think, I think that's a great start as well, is just actually understanding the spectrum of all the possible ways that um, yeah, people can be emotionally harmed by their linguistic identity being excluded by a system. And uh, when, I, when I was working up that, that slide, um, knowledge I think is something that really needs to be explored. I'll just, I'll just say that, that it wasn't a good category for, for the bias there, and there has to be. in a way that, you know, you, you think that your child didn't hear you on the phone swearing about some situation or when you, you know, get something or whatever, and then it comes out at this inappropriate moment. Um, <laughs> and it's sort of, I suppose, the attention to detail and the care, and that's why I suppose for me it's about this transdisciplinary work and integration and training of people across different disciplines to respect both sides, um, because if you don't have people like me as a teacher, I came in with no real understanding of how badly certain things could be skewed for teachers if I didn't think about them and if I didn't worry about them <laughs> late at night. Um, because, you know, we have some questions in language teaching, this quick example of, you know, how much time does this teacher spend in a target language, for example? And their whole professional practice could be made or destroyed on account of how long they spend in a language. Um, but if you're using machine to transcribe them and you've, your data set skews the timing of those crosshairs, <laughs> you, know, you start expanding their time in target language or expanding their time in the language of the wider community. It's just things like that. I think the transdisciplinary work, that kind of knowledge and love for the, the space that you're in, it's protective of that space that you're in, but at the same time, you actually have to become educated about machines and how they learn and how they operate in order to know what you're protecting things from. Um, I think we'd better move on because we've got a question here and we've kind of got time for the last question. Oh, okay, I'll make it very direct. Um, being the bright young minds you are and the future of linguistics and uh, knowledge in this space, I was wondering when, if you choose to, when you get tenure and you become like the director of a school of your academic institution of choice uh, and you got to design like an undergraduate course that you think would make linguistics better, what would that course B, and it can be really short, and I want one from each, if I may. <laughs> really short. <laughs> Way to throw me under the bus here, guys. Yeah. Um, look, I think it has to, like, you can't just have one course that addresses You only get one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would have each layer and computational methods that address each layer of linguistics. Good, thank you. Meg? Um, I, I think everyone might know my answer. I think it's data processing. I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's no substitute for just um, 
getting to know your data and the data you're working with so thoroughly that you know it inspires you or like. Makes you happy. Does he get aware of that? No, no, he doesn't. The next one. <laughs> Because that's it. I mean, you have to, you have what goes in is what comes out of the system. So you have to know your data. Yeah. One of you could flip to like ethics. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 right. 